Hello and welcome to week four of our lecture series on usability principles and practice. This week we are looking at satisfaction and how can you measure how satisfied someone is. Now this is part one of the video, we're going to have part two coming up later on with uh, quantitative analysis, maybe even part three about qualitative thematic analysis, more on that later. But right now we're just focusing on what is satisfaction? Why do we care about it? And how do we measure it as UX designers? So at the end of the session, I want you to be able to recognize the role satisfaction metrics play in identifying usability issues to influence the redesign of websites. I want you to have abilities in collecting satisfaction data from users in the form of quantitative surveys and qualitative observation within a research context. And then you will be able to analyze quantitative data using sample statistical tools and thematically analyze observable data. Now, as I said, we're gonna have different parts of the series over the next week. So this is your introduction. If you get to the end of this and think, ah, oh, that's great, but I don't have the abilities, don't worry, they are coming. If there's anything that's not covered on here, don't worry, comment below and I'll make a video directly for you to help do this. We're going to start by looking over just what are satisfaction metrics, then go over quantitative rating scales, and finally qualitative insights. It's worth mentioning here that quantitative numbers and qualitative phrases, neither one are better or worse. They are both very useful in their own way. So you should be getting to grips with both of them. So start of satisfaction. Got a lovely lady here looking very satisfied with her life. So how can we understand what this is? Now, why do we have them? UX focuses on a whole range of the user experience. So we think about you know how well you can use a website, how fast, what your body's doing, um, is it complying to uh, standards, all those kind of things. Um, and it's very difficult to simply quantify something. So when someone goes, oh, wow, this website's amazing, or oh, I hate it, it's just ugly, or whatever, you need to be able to quantify that in some way, but it's very difficult to do that. So we need measures to really get into grips with this. Now, 66% of all UX studies before the year 2011 were based on emotion, enjoyment, and aesthetics. Now, think about that. Almost all, well, well over half of all studies are focusing on those soft subjects. Therefore, we must really respect the soft aspect of UX and run with it if we're to get a great picture of how well it is functioning. Uh, I'll show you this, this map form. The idea that um, usability engineering was a big thing about 15 years ago and it's really just dis disappeared um, because we're not looking at usability as something you can just mine, something you can just make happen. Like uh, when you engineer a car engine, it's not an emotional aspect as such. You're making something functionally work. So usability engineering has dropped off. UX researcher has really taken off and really taken its place because the UX researcher, yes, we understand the hard numbers, we understand the performance aspects, but we understand that the human inside is just as important as all that. So we must really respect this. Then we are investigating how we feel rather than what people do. Lots of it is very subjective. Um, it, you really think um, if, if a website or an app, it works slow. If a website for an app um, doesn't work with heuristics, as we covered last week. If it doesn't work with um, biometrics, so you're a bit jumpy, you're a bit stressed, but the user is very, very happy, then it doesn't really matter, or it doesn't matter so much. So satisfaction is the most important metric. And I had a conversation with consultants from Bunnyfoot recently, and they were saying, yes, we agree, satisfaction is the number one thing we are aiming for as UX professionals. So let's dive now into how we quantify this, how we understand if the website is or is not satisfying. So let's go for the first one, the quantitative rating scales. These are producing numerical outcomes, so numbers. 
you can compare them over time, you can track them, and because of this nature, management absolutely love them because they could say, yes, we've had 500% in performance this month, we've had 100% over the last year, whatever it is. Management don't like so much the soft aspects, the, you know, people are saying this and feeling that, they like the hard numbers. So it's a great skill as a UX designer or consultant to get to grips with numerics um, or quantitative metrics. The ways you can think about this, there's two main kinds of ways to quantify how you feel. The first one is the most common, you will have seen it around, it is called the Likert scale. The second one is the semantic difference scale. Um, that's less common, but it still has a great place as um, a metric. The Likert scales, um, it's just turning your emotions into numbers. So we have an example here, I really enjoy using the website, strongly disagree or strongly agree, or somewhere in the middle. Now you're saying how much you agree with the statement that you can turn this into something else. Now, the problem with this is that the difference between strongly disagree, strongly, sorry, <laughs> missing my words here, strong disagree and strongly agree may not be the same size of difference between agree and strongly agree. Now, what about between disagreeing and being ambivalent, being neither agreeing or disagreeing? Is that the same gap as between neither agree nor disagree? This is a serious issue with Likert scales that we have to think of. And this gets more complex when we think of different kinds of Likert scale. So you have a very basic one with maybe three categories, your standard's got five and your advanced is nine. Now there is research say that nine is better than five because when you give someone a nine point scale, as you see at the very bottom here, people really have to consider whether they are saying the right thing. They have to consider whether they're placing their tick in the right area, more so than with five. Now, the jury's out on this one. I've used five points successfully in many research papers that are published in great journals. So, you know, I still lump for five as a way of doing things. People find it very easy, but you know what? If you go for nine, that's great. The only thing to avoid is three. The reason why we have three is it oversimplifies the question. Now, that is great when you're interviewing children um, who will have a lower mental capacity to reconsider the differences between liking, not, or being ambivalent. Now, bearing in mind that our frontal cortex, our brain, doesn't stop developing until we are 25, you know, maybe teenagers and early students could still benefit from number three. But hey, five is standard. The other one you see is semantic different scales. Now, these give you um, bipolar opposite adjectives. So, you know, the examples here, I think the website's homepage is weak or strong, ugly, beautiful, cool, warm, amateur, professional. So you're still getting a degree of uh, agreement. Now, the um, second one, ugly and beautiful, that's all about aesthetics. So we have two bipolar adjectives about um, beauty, aesthetics. So in this case, um, a four is very middle of the road, doesn't mean much, but um, that's cause me to find that. If someone said it was, no, it was uh, nine, it was beautiful, then we are saying the aesthetics are very high school. These are quite difficult to produce, believe it or not, because you have to really consider, are these two words true bipolar opposites? Do people really understand it? Different cultures will have different understandings of words. So it's something you have to really work out that Likert scales don't have the problem with. However, they do have their place. Now, that's um, two kinds of scales you can use. So let's dive now into the kind of scales that you can use to assess satisfaction. Making your own scale is very, very difficult. Um, you might have to get 500 or 1,000 survey responses, run some pretty intermediate but pretty advanced in some ways stats to really crunch and prove your data. It's not as simple as putting questions on a list and saying, do you agree, then adding everything up because of logical reasons, which I won't go into this video. Maybe a different video, I'll cover that. So it's much better if you're doing a master's or even a PhD to take existing metrics and use them. They're proven to work, 
they are proven as robust and you are in great company. I'm going to cover three of them, which are the ASQ, After Scenario Questionnaire, the Expected Measure, and the SUS System Usability Scale. I'm saving SUS to last because, frankly, it's the best. It's the one I use the most, and in some countries, if you want to do a UX-based research program and you don't have SUS, you're not going to get funded. So it's a really fantastic one for you to learn. Now, after scenario questionnaire, first one. We give people three questions when they're finished interacting with a prototype. So number one, am I satisfied with the ease of completing the task in this scenario? Two, am I satisfied with the amount of time it took to complete the tasks in this scenario? Number three, I am satisfied with the support information, so online help, messages, documentation, when completing tasks. You use a Likert scale, so for each of these questions you have between one and five, whether you strongly agree or strongly disagree. And this is what it looks like. So quite a simple format, um, questions on the side, with degree, disagree, nice and simple, we can do that. You can add your numbers up and then that gives you a number between one and 15. Sorry, complete lie, what am I saying? Between 3 and 15. So we can tell if um, the satisfaction has increased between prototypes for A-B testing. We can say how it's changed over time. We get a good feel of if we're generally where we are. So you could also average them. So out of 5, the average, you know, we're picking out an average of 4. We're okay. Anyhow, moving on. Expectation measure. This one is very different. What it is, it's saying, what do you think this website or app is going to be like? Then you use it and then you say, hey, how was it? Does it meet your expectation? So are we disappointing you or not? Now, where you do this is before you use the website, you say, hey, how easy or difficult do you think this task will be to complete? After the deadline, how easy or difficult did you find this task? And then you map this on a metric. So once again, example of how you do the page, two questions, lick at scale, nice and easy. But then you map them onto a grid. So in this case, every single dot is one response. Now, this is just scattering the dots around to show you example. Uh, in reality, you'll probably get clustering around certain areas. If you're in the lower left hand, um, of the grid. That means that people expected it to be hard to use and it was hard to use. That's a great opportunity because you can definitely improve this. There's great ways you can clearly improve the website because it looks hard and bloody hell it was. You can fix it. Now, if you've got a website where people are expecting it to be hard and actually it was really easy, you need to promote this as, hey, we've made something that's complex in something that's super easy. That's top left. Now, example of that could be some website doing stats. Everyone thinks of statistics or stats as being very difficult, very hard to understand. But if you've made them easy, then wow, that's a great tool. In a different way, if people are looking at websites and thinking, hey, this is gonna be easy to use. And you know what it was? Top right corner, then do not touch that. You know, it's already great, it's meeting expectations, leave it alone. But the last one, which is bottom right, people think it will be very easy to do, but actually it's very hard. This is something you must focus on right away because you are really letting people down. Maybe they've used a website somewhere else or an app somewhere else that was super easy to use and hey, you've not been as good you need to improve to keep up. So the um, ASQ rating here really are great at directing what you need to do. And finally, my favorite, the system usability scale. This is a bit more complex than the other two, but not by much. So firstly, you have 10 questions. Um, I think I would use system frequently. I think systems are necessarily very complex, etc. Get someone to use the website, use the app, use whatever you've made, and then get them to answer this. Now, how do you turn this into a uh, usable metric? Well, items one, three, five, and nine, 
you take whatever the score the person got, you minus one, right? So they all scored five, they minus one, they all score four. Items two, four, six, eight, and 10, you take five minus number. So if people scored one, for all those two, four, six, eight, and 10, your new score would be four. Okay, so you've just done a very simple bit of maths on that. You need to use an Excel spreadsheet, which is not too difficult. If you don't know how to do that, comment below and I'll make a video showing you how to do that. Anyway, total score, it's all those new numbers rounded, added up, times that by 2.5 and you have your SUS score out of 100. If you get a score below 50, your design is not acceptable. It is not good enough. You need to redesign it because your satisfaction is too low. Let's look at the questions here. I feel confident using the system. I imagine most people would learn to use system quickly. These are great questions. If you are a satisfied person, you'll mark very highly on the positive ones. Of the negative questions, such as number eight, I found the system very cumbersome to use, you're gonna mark down low. So this really is a fantastic thing. Just to make it easier, this is um, you know, another way of writing the same information of you know how you calculate. So get into that, it's really, really it's fantastic. I strongly recommend SUS because hey, you can score between 50 and 70, and you go, hey, it's okay. Maybe it's not a priority to redesign, but I think we should soon. Or maybe you could score over 70 and go, hey, this website is definitely good. We should consider not touching it too much. SUS is a great director, just like ASQ before is a great director. So how do you collect your data for a scale? So you can go for paper-based surveys, which is pretty good actually. People are very familiar and trusting of paper-based surveys walk around the clipboard, people will answer it. But if you go for an online survey, that has a lot of benefits. It's actually easy to, cl to collect the data. Um, I've done surveys before where I've put a link up on Facebook, shared the link, and hey, next morning, 200 people have answered my survey. I didn't have to go out there and do it. I didn't have to enter data into anything. It's already ready to go. But the problem is that lots of people will see a link and not really trust it. Some people see QR codes and refuse to click on them. So you will lose some people by getting others. Overall, I would say that the positives outweigh the negatives. Where you go to collect surveys really is your choice. Here's some very popular ones. Google Forms, I love it. Really fantastic with inbuilt data analysis. Bristol Online is another great one. So jump. Um, W, it's a question you're now called WJX. They've just changed their name. They work in China. So if you want to collect Chinese data, that is the only one I use. The other alternative is Microsoft Forms. I believe that might be working in China soon. If it's not, hey, if you know about the answer, comment below and tell me. But Microsoft Forms work with Office 365. If you've got a subscription to that, you've got this form ready. <clears throat> so how do you analyze the data? So general league of scale data, which goes between um, scores one, scores five. So you want to show it in some way. Really common ways of doing this are bar charts and box plots. Pie charts are another very popular one, but I tend to ignore that because pie charts kind of lie. And I'm going to show you why they lie in a second. Now, statistics, T-test, ANOVA, MANOVA, whatever it is, these are fantastic, but you do have limitations. Firstly, you need large sample sizes. A t-test with less than 35 people, you can just forget it. If you're doing ANOVA, um, if you don't know what it is, don't worry, but it's a way of checking um, how the groups are different. But ANOVA, you need like uh, maybe 100 or 200 people. Sometimes for any test, you need 1,000 people. So we're gonna sidestep the stats issue and just look at simple analysis. So pie charts. Why do I say these aren't very good? Now, these three pie charts look very similar to me. You know, they've got some kind of colors in the same way. They move around. So yeah, they're about the same. But when we put the data in a bar chart, we see a very different story. Actually, charts A and chart C are completely opposite of each other. 
you know, completely mirror images, and chart B is just neutral. So by charts, say pie charts are a very bad way at convincing someone of a story when a bar chart is much better. If in doubt, do not use a pie chart. So that's our quick ramp through uh, quantitative metrics. We're going to take another video another day to look at stats, which will help make that clearer. So let's now dive into qualitative insights. Qualitative insights don't have that hard metric that um, quantitative do. They're softer, they're gentler, they're more indicative. They're giving you a suggestion of what things are. They find insight which you don't always have. So numerics, you tend to have to know what you're looking for before you look for it. Qualitative, you discover what's out there. It lets you understand why people feel the way they do, not just what are they doing. You definitely need lower sample sizes, so they are less authoritative in that you're not getting a wide reach of what people in the world are doing, but they're still very good. Generally, I would say these are the best insights for directing design. They tell you, hey, people have these emotional issues we must address. So you are thinking about three basic stages of website or app use, so before, during, or after. In the before stage, we would interview somebody, understand the ideas they have about the website already. Before they've been biased by your use, you're finding out what they're thinking about. Look at the common themes. So find out what websites they're familiar with. Find out what they want to do in the website. And then how easy they think the task will be. This is quite similar to ASQ. Um, during, you would have what's called Think Aloud Protocol. So you video them and record them using the website and they're talking through what they're thinking, what they want. So. I'm looking for this item, I'm trying to find the button, I'm entering this password, etc. Very simple thinking aloud. Now I'm going to show you a very quick video of me using that um, to look at a good food uh, website. So here we go. So I'm looking on the website and just scrolling down, um, seeing a Halloween thing around here, a little dark, oh, Halloween cupcakes, okay. Um, I'm looking for a link to Halloween stuff, um, but it's not there. So that's me looking at um, Halloween websites. So you can see that Think Aloud is a very simple protocol, just saying what's on your mind as you're working through. Then after the interview, you want to ask someone about what they found out about the website. Common things people will use are, how easy was that website to use? What would you want to use website again? Does the website compare to other websites you have used? And do you think there are enough functions on the website? Then to analyze this, you use thematic analysis. I mentioned this a few weeks ago in the earlier videos, and now we're getting into it. Now, thematic analysis is turning what you see on paper um, you know, transcript, so you write out what the interview is, turning that into themes that keep recurring. It can take a long time. One hour of a think aloud can be four hours of transcription. You want to highlight insightful sections, give each part individual codes, and then count up frequencies. So let's go and see what that looks like. This is a transcript of the video you just saw. So. I'm looking at the website, so scrolling down. I'm seeing a Halloween thing around here. Oh, Halloween cupcakes. Okay, etc. we're going on. All I've done is I've gone a very high level and say, right, there's things I'm doing, which are in yellow, things I'm thinking in green, and things I'm feeling in blue. You'll notice that the first um, feeling part I've highlighted is, oh, which is surprise. Now that's inferred from watching the video and hearing the tone of voice. So don't take writing as verbatim. It's not automatic. You need to reconsider what's being said. I can then add codes here. So D1 is appearing twice. What is D1? I'm looking on the website, so scrolling down, seeing a Halloween thing around. So I'm D1 is searching. 
Okay. D2, I've seen a Halloween icon here to click on that. So D2 is you know, searching for an icon. I'm going to click on something. So these are two different things and so on. Then we make a nice table and we write all the codes we've got. We have the frequency and we can see what's happening here. So in my very simple think aloud, there's four times I'm searching for Halloween things and there's four times the content is not appropriate. There's one time I like the content, three times I'm wanting to filter content. So these frequency numbers are telling you how often they occur. It doesn't necessarily tell you how important they are. For example, there's one occasion of me being annoyed and one occasion of me being surprised. Now, I would argue that the annoyance is a stronger issue than a surprise. So it's got more weight behind it. Maybe even having one annoyance is more important than four issues of the content not being appropriate. You really have to be the judge of this and interpret it based on what you see in the videos and what you're trying to find out. Don't take the numbers as being hardline quantitative insights. They're just to guide you in thinking about what you must address, what you should address, what you could address, and maybe what you won't address. So here we are at the end of the session. Let's see how we're done. So we've looked at quantitative data. We've produced benchmarks. We are going to compare things over time. So A-B testing and management are going to love it. We've looked at qualitative. So understanding the actions, thoughts, and feelings of people. We're doing interviews before. We're doing think lab before. We're doing interviews after. We're collecting that. We're writing it up. We're doing thematic analysis and getting our nice grid saying, right, what's going on? And we use this to direct the design of more satisfying interfaces. So if you like this video, please like, comment, and subscribe. It really helps make the channel grow. And also, we've got new things this week. We've got a podcast out. I've now started a podcast called The Usability Podcast. Find it on Apple Podcast and the Himalaya app. We're looking at other platforms for Spotify, but hey, Himalaya is cross-platform and Apple Podcast. If you've got an iPhone, download that one today, listen in, and I really hope this helps your journey as a usability designer. That's everything for today. I've been Chris Parker. You can find me on Twitter at usergendesign. That's gen, G-E-N, usergendesign. So tweet me on there. We'll start the conversation further. Thank you very much.